Robert Goddard devoted his life to exploring ways of obtaining the objective that has mystified humankind for centuries, space travel. Throughout his work, he encountered many difficulties and failures, which he overcame through amazing persistence. He simply did not give up. And I think it is that persistent effort, that dedication to a dream, that sets him apart from normal people. Goddard exchanged his findings through 214 patent publications, a professorship, and numerous articles in the press. Because of the work of this stubborn scientist, future generations were inspired to follow in his footsteps, and the space age was born. The most significant end result of Goddard's work happened in 1969 when people walked around on the moon. And we have to remember a lot of other people contributed to that result but he was the first one to start working in that direction. Robert H. Goddard was born in Worcester, Massachusetts to Fanny and Nahum Goddard in 1882, an age of invention. When he was 11 or 12, his mother had a baby boy named Richard. Soon after birth, the baby died of a spinal deformity. Because of his brother's death, Goddard's mother and grandmother became overly cautious about his safety. They had an enormous impact, especially his grandmother, who was really too overprotective. Uh, kept him home every time he had a sniffle, as if he was really sick, which he wasn't. And uh, he was 21 years old uh, when he graduated from high school. Goddard's family encouraged him to read and experiment. His interest in science fiction was piqued by H.G. Wells, author of War of the Worlds, and Jules Verne, who wrote From the Earth to the Moon. His father, Nahum, also shared his interest in inventing, hiking, fishing, and photography with Robert. Then, when he was 17, he had a vision of going into space from atop his cherry tree. Later, he said, I imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars. After Goddard's cherry tree vision, he was determined to find a way to space. In 1912, he started exploring the possibility of using solid-fuel rockets to reach extreme altitudes. Despite common belief at the time, Goddard proved that rockets could work in the vacuum of space and that his theory was sound. Goddard's greatest accomplishments during this time were his first two patents entitled Rocket Apparatus. These patents covered four major principles of rocketry. These included the use of a combustion chamber and nozzle, feeding successive portions of propellant into the combustion chamber, using multiple stage rockets, and using liquid propellants instead of solid fuel. After these two major patents, Goddard kept on working on his rocket design. During 1915 through 1916, almost every day there was another experiment going on in the Clark University Physics Lab where Goddard taught. During this time, he made many patent publications, although most were on minor components of the rocket. Goddard was able to gain military funds, which he used to produce a portable infantry rocket that was later turned into the bazooka. Goddard soon began to realize that solid fuels weren't powerful enough to get him to the high altitudes that he wanted to achieve. So in 1919, he started working on a rocket fueled off of liquid hydrogen and oxygen. The advantages of liquid fuels uh, become pretty obvious. Solid fuels are devilishly difficult to manage. Once you light a solid, you're pretty much stuck with how it's going to burn. You can't really control things. Uh, with liquid fuels, you can put an on and off valve on it. You can control the flow. You can increase it, decrease it, shut it off entirely. Uh, they're a lot safer. They have their own problems, of course, but uh, obvious the solution was liquids from solid. On March 16, 1926, Goddard made history by launching the first liquid fuel rocket. Uh, he got his first one up in 1926, and it was up just a few seconds and it fell back down. But it was more than five years before anybody else got a liquid fuel rocket off of the ground. During Goddard's career as a rocket scientist, he was constantly struggling for funds. In order to get money, he needed constant press coverage, but sometimes the papers over-exaggerated his work. 
Instead of annoying Goddard, he thoroughly enjoyed all this publicity. During this period, Goddard married Esther Kisk, who through constant documentation influenced how the world would remember Goddard's work. In July 1929, the newspapers over-exaggerated so much that it caused the governor of Massachusetts to ban his rocket from the state because he thought they could be hazardous. This article also piqued the interest of Charles Lindbergh and Daniel Guggenheim. Their support was helpful both financially and in publicity. It was Lindbergh who suggested Roswell, New Mexico as an ideal site for Goddard's experiments since he could no longer work in Massachusetts. In 1929, Goddard, his wife, and his crew moved to Roswell. Here they started working on several different series of rockets. The first was the A-series, which exceeded the speed of sound on March 31, 1935, the first object of any kind to do so. The K-series used a nitrogen liquefier, but the chambers suffered from combustion heat. The L-series reached an altitude of 8,000 feet on August 9, 1938, Goddard's highest flight. Goddard then moved on to the P-series, where mishap followed mishap. Because of this and Goddard's winning publicity, the P-series were the last rockets to fly in New Mexico. Goddard was regarded as the man who would take us to the moon. Everyone in 1938 knew Goddard, the number one rocket man. He was better known than Einstein and was the most publicized scientist after Edison. But in Goddard's last few years, his publicity slowed down and only the army would employ him. While Goddard was building and launching rockets, two other men, Konstantin Shilkovsky of the Soviet Union and Ermin Obert of Germany, were developing rocket theories. Obert was the dreamer. Uh, he came up with the ideas, the words that inspired other people. You had Sidlikovsky, who was the theorist, who was able to think out ideas on paper or in his head and envision things that could be done. But Goddard's the guy who came in and did the work and made it happen. Goddard resented competition from other countries, and he believed that the Germans had stolen his patents in order to create the V-2 rocket. He uh, had it in his own mind that anything that they or anybody else came up with in rocketry they had to have stolen from him. Shortly after the V-2 incident in 1945, Goddard died due to tuberculosis and a lifetime addiction to cigars. After his death, Esther and Harry Guggenheim sued the U.S. government for the use of his patents. The government agreed to pay $1 million in Goddard's name and create the Goddard Space Flight Center for him. Goddard's influence on the modern space program is very extensive. He started working on most of the stages of a liquid fuel rocket before anybody else. No rocket today can reach space without using at least one of Goddard's many patents. Well, today's space program uh, does use virtually all of Dr. Goddard's early work. Just about every phase of the modern rocket was worked on at some time by Dr. Goddard. It is therefore understandable that Goddard be counted as one of the world's greatest rocketeers and have many monuments in his name. Charles Lindbergh once said, probably no figure in the history of science had a greater vision than that of Robert Goddard. What more is needed to carry mortal man into fields of the immortals? Robert Goddard devoted his life to reaching his dream of space travel. Although he encountered many difficulties and failures, he succeeded in being the first to reach extreme altitudes. He exchanged his knowledge through patents and articles and inspired generations to follow in his footsteps. Even today, Goddard's patents are present in the space shuttle program. To this day, Goddard's high school speech remains true. The dream of yesterday has become the reality of tomorrow.